afternoon, everyone. So, um, my name is Thierry Chevalier. Uh, actually, I am a software engineer um, with a specialty in WebGIS, uh, for which I'm doing uh, training in software design, which are quite different activities, anyway. But, um, and um, I've been mainly involved in um, not so much in archaeological projects, actually, but mainly in cultural inventories and uh, also for projects for geological surveys. But in, in the context of providing trainings, uh, I realized that the tools and technologies that were used by the different communities uh, were somehow the same. Um, I'm not a 100% um, computer geek anyway. Uh, I'm also a student in ancient history. Um, and then uh, I would like to uh, just split my presentation in two parts uh, because um, the first part was free and open source uh, geospatial software. And I, um, I would like to talk to you about a conference which is um, uh, actually taking place every year. I don't know if you uh, have heard about it, but it's a free and open source software for geospatial conference, uh, which is an annual recurring global event hosted by the open source geo community. And if you're into the mood of uh, contributing to open source projects, and um, if you have a low budget, for instance, for your projects, I really suggest you strongly to attend this kind of event because this is really extremely interesting. So what is the OSGO? Um, it is um, a not-for-profit software foundation uh, devoted to the open for philosophy at large. So uh, the OSGO just maintains some projects that you are probably uh, heard about some, probably not all, all of them, um, but then you could see you've got content management systems, you've got catalog for geodata, you've got desktop applications and, and web mapping facilities. So when you're uh, trying to say, okay, um, we'll be using open source geospatial software, and you come to this page and say, okay, but where should I start? So my personal advice on this, uh, it would be for you to start on uh, GDAL and OGR. For what reason? Because this is um, uh, a geospatial library which allows you to perform reprojections and um, conversion, uh, format conversion. And um, why is this so important? Is because when you go to, I don't know if you know the Stack Exchange, probably if you've got a problem in, in, in web development somehow, and, and it's particularly the case in WebGIS, if you ask Google, like then Google asks. Uh, St uh, GIS Stack Exchange. And one of the main topics about this is about coordinate systems. It's really something people struggle, uh, struggle with. And the other uh, main topic is about the raster data format. And GDAR uh, allows you to perform all this. So then it was to start. Um, but then uh, what should you learn in um, the second way? Uh, well, I would say it's up to you, it's up to, to your needs and so on, but mainly if you deal with uh, raster data, for instance, uh, I would just uh, talk to you about QGIS, and if you deal with uh, vector data, uh, I would talk to you about uh, PostGIS. So uh, PostGIS is a special database, uh, which is um, perfectly fine for hosting um, and for developing, uh, handling, sorry, um, vector data. So, um, in the second part, I would like to talk to you about archaeology open data. Um, well, what are open data? Data that are accessible online, with an, which are openly licensed. For instance, Creative Commons by, which, is, uh, which means that you uh, provide credit from the original author. Reusable and free. And then for archaeology, um, open data means uh, something quite specific because we have um, repositories which are dedicated to archaeology data. So uh, there are plenty of them, but I only mentioned one, which is the archaeology data service, because it's probably the, the most important. You've got platforms uh, providing access to uh, uh, referencing these repositories, about the area, and then we've, you have got data papers, so the Journal of Open Archaeology Data. So, um, well, uh, as you as researchers, why would you um, provide open data access? Um, why would you open your data? So, um, actually, it's a matter of uh, recognition. Um, and and in, in, the, in the beginning, it's all about reuse. So, 
If there is no data reuse, there will not be citation of your, uh, of your data and no recognition. So that's uh, basically what the data papers are about. So for instance, the Archaeology Data Journal, I, I don't know if you uh, come to this website, but when you push some data on it, then it, pro it, it provides st statistics about download, uh, citation and so on, so that you could have um, uh, recognition about it. But then, uh, what I, and this is the point of this presentation, it's um, if there is no perception of your, uh, the potential of the, your data, then there will be no data reuse. And so um, comes uh, the solution from the FOS4G to um, make people perceive the potential of your data. So uh, we propose you here a solution uh, based on PostGIS and CartoDB, which is a, um, um, a solution built on top of PostGIS. So what I've been using here is an open data set, which is the cultural evolution of Neolithic Europe, which is named EuroEvo, and which is a um, data set by Katie Manning and the UCL team. And it is the largest repository of archaeologic site and radiocarbon data from Leonitic, uh, Neolithic Europe, with about 4,000 uh, 4, uh, radiocarbon samples. Um, and then, uh, well, this is basically the, the visualization you get from this data. So, but how could you get the potential of this data set uh, based only on uh, this kind of map is quite difficult to assess. Uh, but it's perfectly fine because for open data, uh, you need to open the access to the raw data, that's very important. But then you could also add um, visualization tools in order for the people to evaluate correctly the potential of your data set. So that's, um, for this I will be showing you a sm small video. So. So using CartoDB, which is built on top of PostGIS, this is uh, an open source solution. So um, we we'll move on a bit. So which allows in really a couple of clicks to uh, upload the data set. So we we'll move a bit forward uh, here. Okay, so you've uh, uploaded your data set and then on this basis, um, you could using PostGIS functions for which there is an API with, on top of it which is provided by Carto and, and which allows you to, for instance, add widgets, that means filters on this data set. For instance, uh, based on the different attributes you've got, for instance, the materials. So what are the radiocarbon samples? Is this charcoal, bones, wood, etc.? So you could add a filter on this uh, input, for instance. So if you click on one thing, you will have a filter on bones data or on wood, if you prefer. That is to say, the sites where these uh, materials have been found. And then you could add different, uh, different widget to it. So you could, for instance, add um, another filter for, for instance, a period. It might be interesting to filter this data set on a period. So then you select the period, uh, period information. And then you've got the different uh, values. Here are only the main values, for instance, where, where are the sites where we have found materials dating from the late Neolithic or uh, from the Bronze Age, for instance. So you see that mainly in, in, in this case. And, and, and you could add all the filters you want uh, regarding your um, attribute data. Uh, what is interesting as well is that you could, could have, you could add temporal filters. So um, uh, here we could have, for instance, the radiocarbon age, which would be a very interesting uh, filter to have on this data. So here, um, it allows you to filter also on a time span, for instance. So you can uh, play with the uh, duration uh, bucket. And then, for instance, filter on a dedicated period. For instance, here, between uh, 4,500 and 3,300 uh, and then you will have a filter on your data based on this. And then you could also animate this data because this is a dynamic phenomenon and then you could, for instance, um, just 
at this when you publish it. So you could have this kind of um, animated view of where are the findings according to uh, sorry. according to the samples. So this is this kind of view that you could uh, have uh, with actually PostGIS. So this is very simple to, uh, to put in place. Sorry, oh, sorry. And then what I would like to talk to you um, now is um, not only the open philosophy in geospatial brings open source libraries and applications, but also a complete open source map of the world, and which is OpenStreetMap, you maybe know. So what is interesting with this project here, I would like to talk to you about a very specific, uh, specific thing, is there is a, a company which um, uh, has decided to uh, contribute to uh, OpenStreetMap and then provide some new uh, facilities, um, uh, open source things, um, to this, and it is the technology of vector ties. So I would like to... Um, um, talk to you a bit about vector ties, because uh, until now, uh, we had on the web browser um, raster ties, which means that at a different uh, zoom level, you had different squares corresponding to different images, and which are uh, sent to you by the server and calculated and put it in cache. So um, the difference with um, raster ties in this case is that rather than sending images, the server sends vector data. So uh, it is not actually text, but kind of binary data. And what does it change? It changes th that the fact that the rendering is not made on the server side, but the rendering is made on the client side. So that changes a lot because uh, you don't have to recreate a whole tile set uh, when you have to want to change a little thing in your map. So for instance, uh, let's say you want to change the size of uh, the country names or um, let's say the um, uh, the color of the forest or the sea or so on you need, you can do it on the browser side without changing everything anything sorry on the server side so one of the um, potential of vector ties in archaeology is according to me when you have to map um, um, changing environments so for instance uh, there is a problem of sea level in in paleo environments so I guess that um, in the future years it will be much easier to build a sleepy maps, which means uh, vector tile sets, um, for uh, maps um, with uh, different sea levels according to the use. So, um, well, the only thing missing for the time being is just a bathymetric uh, vector tile set, which is, um, I know that Mapbox had I work on um, uh, open source of open, um, vector tie set for the terrain, well, but unfortunately they are not bathymetric data. So that does not allow us to build a map for, let's say, uh, the Ice Age era, but I'm pretty sure it will be the case uh, for in, in the next year. So um, this is very promising technology. So, uh, and I would like to end it with my presentation with this aspect. So when we talk about open source projects, Something that you might think about is which open source should I contribute to or could I contribute to in order to give back what I, what I gain for this project. So, um, well, uh, at least I would advocate the, the thing I'm contributing to is just OpenStreetMap and particularly OpenStreetMap and cultural heritage. So, uh, because I made two observations, not the one <laughs> who made them, but uh, you, everyone could make them, it's just, it's just that the location is the leaking pin for every cultural heritage data. And that the potential of OpenStreetMap for cultural heritage has not yet been explored. Uh, you, would not, uh, you would be very surprised to see and to uh, discover how many contributors of OpenStreetMap there are even in your surroundings. And uh, in this very large community, which is over a million, uh, a million of, uh, of persons, there are, of course, people interested in culture. So. Um, there is um, an initiative that has started, in, at least in France, which is to start to map um, the... I don't know if you see it. 
the indoor location of artifacts uh, in museum collections. Sorry, it's not working. So I need to switch here. So um, if you go to OpenStreetMap and then try to, um, for instance, look for the Louvre Museum, then if you're not uh, authenticated, then you will only see the buildings. So you might think OpenStreetMap is only about the outside of buildings, but actually it's not. And if you go into, uh, if you enter into the edit mode, then you will see that uh, when you contribute, you enter into this mode, you will see that actually uh, the inside of buildings is also mapped. And you've got all the artifacts, or uh, a lot of them, in the collection of the Louvre. So for instance here, you could see the locations of, um, let's say, this is the Egyptian collection. So here you have a mummy mask with a lot of metadata, which is uh, you know, specifying what it is about, dynasty, ancient Egyptians, and what is interesting is you've got the origin as well. So you could link it to somehow um, archaeological data or at least uh, excavation sites or uh, location where the, where, the, um, where the artifact has been found. So, and this is the case for um, a lot of um, data in the Louvre. So obviously this representation is not adapted to uh, inside the, the in, in indoor locations. But there are some initiatives as well in OpenStreetMap community to provide visualization and contribution tool for um, um, indoor locations. So that was an insight about something to contribute to, if you want. So that's it for me. Oops, sorry. No, oh, that's not this one. So thank you very much.